Hello, I'm Rose of Pursuit, and today I'm reading The Twelve Degrees of Humility and Pride by St. Bernard of Clairvaux. This book will take a few weeks, so make sure to subscribe to catch the next part or check the link in the description for the playlist if it's complete. Preface You have asked me, Brother Godfrey, to expand and to put into writing the substance of the addresses on the degrees of humility which I have delivered to the brethren. I admit that, anxious as I was to give this request of yours the serious answer that it deserved, I was doubtful whether I could comply with it, for, with the evangelist's warning in my mind, I did not venture to begin the work till I had sat down and calculated whether my resources were sufficient for its completion. Then, when love had cast out few that I had entertained a ridicule for failure to complete my work, it was replaced by misgiving of a different kind, for I was apprehensive of greater danger from the credit that might attend success than of the disgrace that might attach to failure. So I found myself, as it were, at the parting of ways indicated respectively by affection and by fear, that I was long in doubt as to which was the safer choice. For I was afraid that if I said anything worth saying about humility, I might myself be found wanting in that virtue, whereas, if on the grounds of modesty I refused to speak, I might fail in usefulness. And I saw that, though neither of these courses is free from peril, I should be obliged to take one or the other. So I have thought it better to give you the benefit of anything that I can say, than to seek personal safety in the harbor of silence. And I honestly trust that, if I am fortunate enough to say anything which commends itself to you, I may have in your prayers a safeguard against pride, whereas is more likely I produce nothing worthy of your attention, there will be no possible cause for conceit. Summary. Now, stick around, the summary is interesting. The Twelve Degrees of Humility Taken Upwards Constant abstinence from sin or fear of God. 1. Constant abstinence from sin or fear of God. 2. Forbearance to press personal desire. 3. Obedient submission to superiors. 4. Patient endurance of hardship and severity in the spirit of obedience. 5. Confession of sins. 6. Admission and acknowledgement of one's own unworthiness and uselessness. 7. Belief in and declaration of one's inferiority to others. 8. Observance of the general rule of the monastery. 9. Reticence until asked for his opinion. 10. Abstinence from frequent and light laughter. 11. The speech of a monk should be short, sensible, and in a subdued tone. 12. A permanent attitude of bodily and spiritual prostration. These degrees of humility are set out in an in ascending scale. The first two stages must be passed outside the monastic cloister. He who has risen may thus, in the third degree, make his submission to his superior. The Twelve Degrees of Pride Taken Downwards 1. Curiosity When a man allows his sight and other senses to stray after things which do not concern him. 2. An unbalanced state of mind, showing itself in talk unseasonably joyous and sad. 3. Silly merriment exhibited in too frequent laughter. 4. Conceit expressed in much talking. 5. Eccentricity attaching exaggerated importance to one's own conduct. 6. Self-assertion, holding oneself to be more pious than others. 7. Presumption, 
Readiness to undertake anything. 8. Defense of wrongdoing. 9. Unreal confession. Detected when severe penance is imposed. 10. Rebellion against the rules and the brethren. 11. Liberty to sin. 12. Habitual transgression. The two last named downward steps cannot be taken inside the cloister. The first six denote disregard for the brethren, the four following disrespect of authority, the two that remain contempt for God. Part 1 The Twelve Degrees of Humility Chapter 1 The Search for Truth Christ The Goal and the Road I propose to speak of the degrees of humility as St. Benedict sets them before us as not only to be enumerated but to be attained and I will first indicate to the best of my ability the goal that may be reached by their means so that when you have heard the result of its attainment the toil involved in the ascent may be less severely felt. So let our Lord set before us the difficulties that we shall encounter and reward that we shall receive for our toilsome journey. I am, saith he, the way, and the truth, and the life. He calls humility the way, because it leads to the truth, and the former lies the label, and the latter the reward. But he may ask, how am I to know that he was here speaking of humility, since he says without further explanation, I am the way? Listen to his more explicit statement, Learn of me, because I am meek and humble of heart. In this he exhibits himself as a type of humility, a model of meekness. If you imitate him, you will not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. What is the light of life unless it be the truth? which lightens every man that comes into the world and shows us wherein true life consists. For this reason, to those words of his, I am the way and the truth, he added, and the life, as though he meant to say, I am the way which, I am the way because I lead to the truth, and the truth because I promise life. I am myself the life which I give. For this, saith he, is life eternal, that they may know thee, the true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. But admitting this, you may still say, I recognize humility as the way, I long for truth as the reward, but what if the toil of the journey be so great that I am unable to reach the desired goal? To this he replies, I am the life. That is the provision for the journey by which you will be supported on the way. So he exclaims to the wanderers and to those who do not know the road, I am the way. To the doubters and disbelievers, I am the truth. To those who have begun the ascent and are getting tired, I am the life. I think that it has been made sufficiently clear by the passage quoted from the gospel that the reward for humility is the apprehension of truth. And take another passage. I praise thee, Father of heaven and earth, because thou hast sent these things, that undoubtedly means secret truths, from the wise and the prudent, that is, from the proud, and hast revealed them unto babes, that is, to the humble. This affords further evidence that the truth which is withheld from the proud is disclosed to the humble. The following may be taken as the definition of humility. It is the virtue which enables a man to see himself in his true colors, and thereby to discover his worthlessness. And this is the characteristic virtue of those who are disposed in their hearts to ascend by steps from virtue to virtue until they reach the summit of humility, where, standing on Sion as on a watchtower, they may survey the truth. Or, saith the psalmist, The lawgiver shall give a blessing. He then, who gave the law, will also provide the blessing, that is to say, he who has prescribed humility will conduct us to the truth, and he who is this lawgiver, but the kind and the righteous Lord, 
It has given a law to those who fail in the way. And surely those who have forsaken the truth have failed on the way, but are they on that account forsaken by the kind Lord? Nay, but it is for these very persons that the kind and righteous Lord prescribes the path of humility, by their return to which they may discover the truth. He allows them an opportunity of regaining salvation because he is kind, yet not without the discipline of law because he is righteous. In his kindness, he will not permit their ruin. In his righteousness, he cannot omit their punishment. Chapter 2 The Ladder of Humility Foreshadowed by which Jacob saw in his vision The refreshment provided by Christ Humility, love, and contemplation Of which love is the central course As on Solomon's table St. Benedict enumerates twelve degrees in this law By which the return to truth is made So that as access to Christ is gained When the Ten Commandments and the twofold circumcision Which together make up the number of twelve Have been passed Truth may likewise be attained by passing through these twelve degrees. And what can be the significance of the fact that the Lord appeared leaning over that ladle, which was shown to Jacob as a symbol of humility, but that the recognition of truth begins when the height of humility is reached? But then the Lord, whose eyes, as he is the embodiment of truth, could neither deceive nor be deceived, was looking down from the top of that ladle over the sons of men, discover whether there is anyone who understands or seeks after God. And does he not seem to cry aloud from on high, and to say to those who seek him, for he knows who are his, Come over to me, ye who desire me, and be filled with fruits. And also, come unto me, ye also, sorry, come unto me, ye who labor, no burdened, and I will refresh you. But what refreshments is there that truth promises to those who attempt and gives to those who attain? Is it perchance love? And this it is at which, as St. Benedict says, the monk who has passed through all the degrees of humility will, will ail long arrive. Truly, love is a delightful and pleasant food, supplying as it does rest to the weary, strength to the weak, and joy to the sorrowful. It is in fact, yoke of truth, easy, and its burden, light. Love is good food, which, as the central dish on Solomon's dinner table, by the aroma of various virtues as by the fragrance of different condiments, refreshes those who are hungry, delights those who give the refreshment. For on it all set out peace, patience, kindness, forbearance, joy in the Holy Ghost. And if there are any other products of truth or of wisdom, they too are there. Humility also has the dishes on the same tray, namely, the bread of affliction and the wine of remorse. These are the things which truth offers in the first place to beginners. For to them it is said, Rise, after ye have sat down, ye who eat the bread of sorrow. There also contemplation has its solid food, made of the fat essence of the corn, the wine that maketh glad the heart of man. To this food truth invites those who have accomplished their course, saying, Eat, my friend, and drink and be inebriated, my dearly beloved. The myth, saith he, be covered with love for the daughters of Jerusalem, that is to say, for the sake of the immature souls, which, while they are as yet unable to receive solid food, must meanwhile be fed with the milk of love instead of with bread, and with oil instead of with wine. And love is rightly called the central course, because beginners are unable, through their timidity, to take advantage of its sweetness, while to those who have arrived at maturity, it is an insufficient substitute for the deeper delight of full vision. The first still require to be cleansed by a, a very bitter dose of fear from the pestilent poison of fleshly lust, and to have not yet discovered the sweetness of milk. The latter have already turned away from milk and are reveling in the delight derived from their entrance into glory. 
those only in the middle, who all on the journey have found some delicious little morsels of love, with which, owing to their weak digestion, they so far have to be content. So the first course is humility, purifying by its bitterness. The second is love, comforting by its sweetness. The third is full vision, secure in its strength. Alas, for me, Lord God of righteousness, how long wilt thou to be angry against the prayer of thy servant? How long wilt thou feed me with the bread of tears, and give me tears for my drink? Who will call me even so far as to that delightful company of love, where the righteous feast in the sight of God, and revel in the fullness of their joy, where I no longer need to speak in the bitterness of my heart, but may say to God, Condemn me not. If, while I feast on the unleavened bread of sincerity and of truth, I sing joyously in the paths of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Yet good is also the path of humility, for by it truth is sought, love is reached, and a share of the fruits of wisdom is obtained. As in a way Christ is the end of the law, so is he the perfection of humility, and the final apprehension of truth. Christ, when he came, brought grace. Truth gives grace to those to whom it has become known, but as it is by the humble that it is known, it is to them that it gives grace. All right. So, before we end it for today, I'd like to mention just how difficult it can be to, re to reconcile ourselves with humility. So, I have a piece of advice. The theological virtue of charity means to love others for God's sake, not their own. Because God loves them. You see, they have a wretchedness within them, and they don't deserve to be loved. And that's that's a part of the bitter fruit of humility. Uh, we don't deserve it. <laughs> Not by our own merit. But you see, because God loves us, me and you and others, we are obliged out of our love for God to love them too. This applies to you. So, an understanding of one's wretchedness does not mean a self-hatred if one loves God properly, but that it does mean that they love themselves for God's sake. It is a supernatural virtue that means that, unlike most virtues that we can develop ourselves through habit, the virtue of charity requires God to infuse it in us. This, we must become disposed to the virtue of charity. We do this through prayer for charity and charitable acts, which expands the chalice so that God may fill us with the, this virtue. I'd also like, when talking about the virtue of charity, to disconnect it from charities that you can donate money to or donate your time to. While that is a charitable act, there are many charitable acts in this world. So, while it's, while it's included under the umbrella of charitable act, there are many others that you can do that are good, that you do for the sake of love and for the sake of God. Okay. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, uh, the ye old English made this a little difficult for me. A little difficult. It was, this was also translated uh, in the public domain, might I add. Uh, it was translated by a non-Catholic, and he didn't quite have the habit of adding verses uh, immediately after a quote of a verse. Uh, he adds it in the footnotes. So while I'm used to... Uh, saying the verses, in this case, I decided to go with uh, changing the, my pitch of voice. So, to differentiate the two. So, hopefully that helped. Okay. I, 
I'm done now. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe. If you enjoyed the book, there's a link in the playlist. There's a link to the playlist in the description below. That is all, and may God bless.